Fair enough. You, you, look, if, if you know it, you might as well use the thing you know rather than trying to... You're, you're trying to... You're trying to port KDE1 to be something that works as a modern desktop. Focusing on doing that rather than spending, you know, however many hours you need to maintain the build system, I think is a much better use of your time. Yeah, it, that's the idea. Is you know, The build system should be there to help you and uh, not be a problem. And mm -hmm. Mason has been... Uh, we ported uh, Osiris, which is the fork of QT2, to Mason. Mm -hmm. And it's just so much easier to use. It's easy to troubleshoot, and uh, it speeds up the uh, building process as well. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note of uh, a fork of QT2, what is it about QT2 that... I'm sure there's a lot of things that QT2 doesn't have that you you would kind of want, but um, at the at the at the base, when we decided to fork it, what was it that you realized that you needed to fix? Well, there were some long-standing bugs. Uh, that work started back in 2016 as well. Okay. Uh, I had a guy help me get running, just just running, and uh, decided to take it further from there, but. There are some odd bugs that you come across in software, like the clipboard. It doesn't really work altogether that great. Okay. <laughs> and one of the things I like to do is I have a retro computer collection. I like my old stuff. And so I have old computers I can run those old Linux distributions on. So I went back and grabbed an old copy of Mandrake, mm -hmm. which came originally with KDE2, which is how you would have gotten QT2 back then. And the clipboard functionality was still a problem back then. So that's not a new bug. And uh, I spent a bunch of time trying to troubleshoot that. And clipboards with X11 is always uh, been a problem. And because we're going to Wayland, there's no real point fixing that because we'll have to rewrite that anyways. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some other odd bugs with old X11 software you don't think about. Uh, one of the things kind of perplexed me for a minute was you would start a program that uses Osiris and it would be washed out on your window for no good reason. Okay. And it uh, turns out there's this extension to X called Composite that changes the uh, color space that's used. And those old ones don't know about it. Uh -huh. So that's another thing that needs to be fixed. There's workarounds, but uh, they're just temporary, you know. Mm -hmm. As far as things I'd like to add, obviously, planning to port to Wayland. So we need to make it work as a Wayland client. And uh, I also want to add uh, markdown support. You know, you can write uh, widgets that use rich text or HTML, but I want them to be able to use markdown because everybody uses markdown nowadays. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> okay. So, wait, I, I, I had something on my mind. I it just vanished from my mind. <laughs> So it's gonna be one of these days. Um, right. So, when you're trying to work out how to do anything with this like old version of Qt, is the uh, the documentation still easily available? Do you have to like dig through the Wayback Machine to go find some stuff? Like, wh what 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 do you have that you can actually work from here? One of the things I like about QT, and this starts at QT version 1 and goes all the way up to version 6, is mm -hmm. the documentation is really good. Uh, I would mm -hmm. say second to none. That's yeah, true, like I said, of QT1 and QT2. When you get the source tarball, the documentation is all there as HTML files. So all the original documentation is still with it. Okay, that makes it and there are there's occasionally really odd comments in the code, like you'll see a to-do fix later, uh, or you know, things like that in the source code from people who were troll tech employees at the time, and uh, some of those have been fixed since then, actually. I'm not surprised at all. Considering the stuff that people see in, like, leaked proprietary code, whether you, whenever you see, like, a, a, a video game where their code is leaked, and you just see just absolutely delusional comments. I have... Look, every open source project is going to be like this. To be fair, a lot of open source projects have no comments, so if you have to-dos, fix this later, that's better than most things have. Yeah, and, you know, I like to... Commenting code's good, and I like to leave some unhinged comments here and there's Easter eggs if somebody <laughs> looks later. 
But uh, to do as a comment is a really good thing because you can grab through those source code files for to do <laughs> and you have your whole list ready there for you waiting. So that's not a bad thing to be doing now. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's a really good point. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. Considering, um, considering when QT2 came out, do you know what they used as source control back then? Because that was like six years before Git. Yeah, so I... There's no uh, source, uh, there's no like archives of the version control back then, but I would like to say they probably use CVS. Mm. Uh, it's old enough, they maybe used RCS. I really don't know either way, but those are some of the more popular things back then. Mm -hmm. So you're basically just using whatever the source code has us to do as your sort of starting point, and then as you run across your own issues, then you deal with those to come. Because, like, some of those to-dos might also just be wrong. They might have put a to-do there, fixed it, and just left the to-do there. Yeah, so one of the ways I overcome that, actually, uh, is, you know, I forked from the last release of QT2, uh, which was 2.3.2, mm -hmm. but, you know, the source code archives contain all of the previous versions, mm -hmm. and so I can... I've imported all those into my Git tree, and so I can compare or, you know, diff between different right. versions to see what's happened. Actually, that's a good point, yeah. Um, <laughs> that is a really good point. So, what ha what is the state that you have QT2 in right now, and what is the state you have uh, KD1 in? Like, I, I know you've said you needed to port stuff over to QT2. Has that effort being mostly done where where is that sort of at right now so as far as osiris goes uh i just did a release not that long ago we're on version 2.4.3 now mm -hmm. that was actually to fix the minor security bugs that were caught when i was packaging it for uh debian actually mm -hmm. uh so there are packages available for debian and ubuntu distributions now um uh, for 32-bit 64-bit and also arm it runs Ooh. on ARM platforms, too, surprisingly. And as far as the uh, port to uh, Osiris goes, that's been done, actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, KDE1 runs on Osiris. There are some uh, bugs to work out before it's really usable. Uh, mm -hmm. Something annoying, like when you click log out, it pops up a log out screen, except you can't click log out again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a bit of a so, problem. A little bit. You could still hit enter, but it's kind of counterintuitive. Something right. basic like that that you would expect to work. And I'm not sure where the bug came. It could have been in the port. It could have already been there. Mm -hmm. Or it could have been introduced, you know, unintentionally. Compilers have changed quite a lot. So it's hard to say where those come from. Mm -hmm. So at this point, you could, <laughs> you could use... KDE1 in its current state. The, well, I guess, what, what, what are you calling it now? What's the fork you've called it? Uh, you know, I, I, I say me, Dad. I, I heard you on the video saying my DE, and quite frankly, I like that pronunciation no. better. It sounds great. <laughs> I wouldn't have guessed. Uh, uh, I would not have guessed the one you said. Yeah, that's probably following the uh, Japanese pronunciation more closely, but I really like the uh, thought of my DE because it's intended, you know, to be at somebody's desktop environment mm -hmm. but uh i don't know if you can see a screen share or not uh, uh yes it will kind of mess with the overlay but you can try to show me i can set stuff up okay i have no idea if this will work but should work see yeah, if it shows up just i don't know if you can see that or not yep, yep that's fine so uh this is actually uh the current fork <laughs> I've got it running in a little uh, XNest window, and you can see there's some bugs running under XNest, like the desktop. Uh, numbers are gone. They were there earlier when I first started, but for mm -hmm. some reason they're not there. But, you know, it, it's for the most part usable. Obviously, some applications, you're missing the icons on the desktop. They crashed at some point long mm -hmm. ago. But uh, the general rule, let's see, you know, usable. Uh, there's weird things you see happen, like uh, if you start Firefox in it, mm. it will suddenly... Uh, Firefox will extend beyond the available screen like it will extend to infinity. Uh, you know, the, it'll maximize to infinity, well mm -hmm. beyond, you know, your borders. Uh, 
but yeah, oh. it's it's usable. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, it, wait, it extends to what? What? Why would it do that? Well, uh, I don't know exactly. Well, yeah, it you used wouldn't to have work, a bug there. And it, and at some point it stopped working. I don't know mm. if it was a Firefox update or, you know, just an odd bug I happened to run into. But mm. what it'll do is KDE1 isn't, isn't uh, aware of multi-monitor. So it'll show up, you know, on both monitors. You can, you know, drag windows, but you can set a window squarely between both monitors and it thinks you're on the same one. Mm -hmm. And I think something to do with that, Firefox somehow thinks that that means the monitor extends indefinitely and so it will continue expanding off to one side till you close it mm -hmm. and if you start google chrome it used to work at some point too but now it just occupies half of one screen and you can't change it so okay yeah sure who, who knows what's happened a little, little gremlins well, that that's actually a really good thing to bring up the multi monitor thing because X eleven and multi monitors has always been like a real, a real weird thing. And because original early X eleven, what is it like nineteen nineteen eighty four? Yeah, nineteen eighty four is the first release of X eleven. Multi monitors were not a thing with that at all at that point. And then basically, what people like. People take for granted the fact that X Render exists. They really, really do. X Render makes things very, very, very convenient. But still, at its core, the idea of multi monitors is kind of like it's kind of like something glued on way after the fact, and it mostly works. Mostly. <laughs> yeah, you know, X Eleven has. Uh actually done its job quite well, you know, for as old as it is. I mean, mm. it's, you know, so many decades old, I'm still running it. Uh, mm -hmm. On a multi-monitor setup, has its limitations, but, you know, everything we use in modern X11 is an extension tacked on top of a very old base. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're right, you know, once XR and R came out, that really changed the game, because before that, they had, I believe, uh, what was called Zinorama. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was really painful to get working. So it's great that we have those tools nowadays. And, you know, now that Wayland's here, those are kind of going by the wayside, but mm -hmm. it still works. 